Hello, hello, grade 12s. Welcome back to the channel, Science Therapy, hosted by the one and only science therapist, Uabudewa Sos Ugobela Wemets. And without any further ado, let's look at these questions that we have here. Okay, so we have a uh, question 10. It says A and B are independent events. So pay attention to that. They are independent events. PA is equal to 1 over 3 and PB is equal to 3 over 4. Now they say determine 10.1.1, the probability of A and B. So I just made you highlight independent events there. So we know that we do have a formula to calculate for independent events. It goes P of A and B is equal to probability of A multiplied by the probability of B. So since we have both of the of those, we can just say 1 over 3 multiplied by 3 over 4, right? Which uh, from here, you can tell that this one will cancel with that one. So this is supposed to be 1 over 4, so cross division. And then uh, that's how you were just supposed to calculate to get uh, the two months. Then we go to 10.1.2. It says, calculate the probability that at least one event occurs, right? Now, the probability that at least one event occurs translates to event A or event B occurring. So we have the probability of A or B. But again, we know the formula to calculate probability of A or B is P of A plus P of B minus P of A and B, right? Because most of the time we know that independent events are not mutual, right? So probability of A is 1 over 3, then the probability of B is 3 over 4, then we have to subtract the intersection that we just calculated, which is 1 over 4. Now, when you simply just punch that into your calculator, you get 5 over 6, right? So just like that, you have begged yourself 4 marks, right? Okay, so uh, let's now proceed. Let's now proceed to 10.2. It says, the probability that it will snow on the Drunkensberg Mountain in June is 5%, right? Then when it snows on the mountains, the probability that the minimum temperature in central South Africa will drop below zero degrees is 72%. If it does not snow, however, the probability that the minimum temperature in, South, in central South Africa will drop below zero degrees is 35%. Now, before we can do anything, note that here we have two events. The pro the first event is the probability that it will snow, right? So it will snow or it might not snow. Then the second event is the probability that the temperature will either drop below zero degrees Celsius or above zero degrees Celsius, right? So 10.2.1 says represent the given information on a tree diagram. Clearly indicate the probabilities associated with each branch. Right. So that means we want to start by doing this for the first event, and then that for the second event. So second event has two branches like that because it's coming from this first event. Then what's the probability that it will snow? And then probability that it will not snow. So note how I indicate it will not snow. Then what is the probability that it will go above uh, zero degrees and then okay so let's start by below so below zero degrees and then uh, not below zero degrees so not below zero degrees would be above and then below zero degrees or above zero degrees right so b for below and then a for above now the probability that it will snow they said it's five percent which uh, obviously using complementary events, every time the branches must add up to 100%, right? So if we have 5% chance that it will snow, then obviously we have 95% chance that it will not snow. Now, if it snows, we have 72% chance that 
the temperature will drop below zero degrees Celsius. But then if we have 72% chance that it will drop below zero degrees Celsius, that means we have 28% chance that it might go above zero degrees Celsius. Right. But then if it does not snow, then the probability of uh, having a temperature that goes below uh, zero degrees Celsius is only 35% which means we have 65% chance that it will go above zero degrees, right? Now, note that uh, the probabilities associated with each branch uh, always add up to 100%. So if you add this up 100%, add this up 100%, add this up, it's 100%. That's how you know that uh, you have done it correctly, right? So that's all you needed to indicate there. So this was for 10.3.1. Now, 10.3.2 says calculate the probability that there will be... F okay, what am I doing? 10.2.2 says calculate the probability that the temperature in Central South Africa will not drop below zero degrees Celsius in June 2024. Note that they did not say whether it snows or it doesn't snow. So that means it uh, encompasses both the uh, events. So if it does snow, what is the probability that you still have your temperature going above zero degrees? If it doesn't snow, again, what is the probability that you'll have your temperature going above zero degrees? Because they said not drop, right? So not drop below zero degrees means it goes above. So that means the probabilities would have to be the 5% corresponding with the 28% and the 90% going with this 65%, right? So that means the probability of that event occurring, let's call it E, is the probability that it will snow and we have a temperature that is above, plus the probability that it will not snow, it will, it will not snow. <laughs> okay, sort of for that. And then uh, still the temperature goes above zero degrees okay so this means we will take note we don't add this two we have to multiply so in this case we have to say five percent multiplied by 28 percent then you say plus again here a 95 percent multiplied by 65 percent you get that right so obviously when you punch all of this into your calculator the probability of that event occurring has to now be let's uh, quickly punch it so we find that it is 63.15 percent right so that's how you go about uh, calculating that okay so i hope uh, 10.2 makes sense now let's go to 10.3 it says 10 learners stand randomly in a line one behind the other 10.3.1 says in how many different ways can the 10 learners stand in the line right so what we are supposed to do here let's just indicate this so we have 10 learners i'll just separate this into one two three four five six seven eight nine ten Right, so we have uh, 10 learners that are randomly standing in line, then they just should be arranged into the standing positions. So the way to think about this one, guys, is to think how many options will each learner have, right? So if we work in the first learner here and then we tell them to stand in line in any standing positions, let's say we have marked these ones, right? We have marked the stand standing positions in their 10. And then we just tell the first learner that walks in, just stand in any random position. That means we are giving that learner 10 options to choose from. So that means the learner has 10 options to choose from. The second learner, when they walk in, because one of the spaces has now been occupied that leaves him with nine options to choose from. And then if that learner walks in, it leaves him with eight options. A fourth learner walks in, it leaves him with seven options. Then just like that, all the way like that, like that, until there's only just one option for the last learner, right? So all of this can be interpreted as 10 factorial because 10 goes all the way to one, right? And then, descending order right so if you want to uh, further 
get the solution to that one you can just press it into your calculator and it gives you three million six hundred and twenty eight thousand and eight hundred right so that's if you just want to write it all uh, in full but then if you just leave it as 10 factorial you still get a mark so it's only one mark guys then okay let's now uh, look at 10.3.2 it says calculate the probability that there will be five learners between two youngest learners in the line right so note this this is now asking for the probability it's different from this 10.3.1 because this one was only asking for the number of different ways in which we can arrange the learners but when we are talking probability we know that's probability of an event occurring which means it's the number of times that the event might occur over the sample space but what is the sample space the sample space is the one that we just calculated in 10.3.1 the sample space represents when there are no restrictions right no restrictions so this is when we are just placing learners randomly so just like in 10.3.1 there are no restrictions howsoever it's just us randomly placing the 10 learners so the 10 factorial will be taken as our sample space so let's note our sample space is 10 factorial so that means what we should find now is the number of a uh, ways in which this event uh, can be arranged right or let's indicate this so i want you it's gonna be a pretty long question to explain but then just bear with me just bear with me i'm just trying to break it down for all of you so that uh, you can understand the approach that needed to be taken to this question so let's just say one I have uh, about 10 blocks in all of this. And then the first thing that you want to do is you focus on the restrictions that you are given. So we have two youngest learners that must sit five uh, distances apart or five standing positions apart because there must be five learners in between these two youngest learners. So let's go ahead here. Yeah? I will just use a different color to just mark this one. So let's say the first learner walks in and and then it's the youngest learner so let's indicate why one the youngest learner let's say we start with the restrictions right let's start with the youngest learner choosing the first seat in here right so there will be him and then he has two options because there are two youngest learners and then these two two youngest learners must sit five air seats uh, apart so when the first young learner walks in he actually has five option uh, two options meant to say then that's two when the second youngest learner walks in he only has one option this one option is to sit five standing positions uh, apart from the other youngest learner so that's one two three four five and then he will be positioned here or will be standing there so this is young learner two with one option now in another different scenario we can have this young learner walk in and then they decide to sit here but then because there is a restriction for the young learners and there are only two that means we're going to have our two here and then when the second youngest learner walks in he must sit or stand five air standing positions apart one two three four five and then they will be found here right okay so in another case this youngest learner must might choose to be on the that seat two options again and then the other learner one two three four five and then they must be seated here only one option and then let's say this time this youngest learner decides to sit on the fourth uh, seat or to stand on the fourth standing position so that's two and then one two three four five that means this one must be found here so that's one here okay so now we are done with the restriction on the learners okay 
Now let's change the color and go back to black for the other remaining learners. So remember the two youngest learners, uh, they are already seated there. Now we are left with eight learners that can be placed randomly. So no restriction on the eight learners. So that means when we walk in the first learner from the eight learners, they have eight options. The second learner, seven options. The third learner, six options like that, right? Until there's only one option for the last learner. Then if in here eight, seven, remember these ones are already occupied, so they cannot go in there. You can't uh, stand where someone else is, uh, is standing. Then eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, and then one. If in here eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so now that we have all of that, we know that the probability is the number of events occurring over the sample space. Now, in how many different ways can we have this set up here? You can see that it's in one, two, three, four. So it only allows for four setup. But then when it comes to the youngest learners, they can be seated either with the first learner being here and then the second learner there. Or it can be the first learner here and then the second learner there. Remember, there's no restriction as to always say, let's say our Y1 is a girl and then our Y2 is the boy, right? So we have two youngest learners, one is a girl and one is a boy. There is no restriction as to whether we should uh, first have the, the, the girl seated down, then the boy, or maybe the boy first seated down, then the girl. So that means it can go both ways. It can be the girl, then followed by the boy. Or it can be the boy and then the girl. So how can we represent that mathematically? We know that means two factorial ways. And then when it goes to the other eight learners, in how many different ways can they be arranged? They can be arranged in eight factorial ways. As we can see here, it's eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, which is eight factorial, even here, eight factorial, eight factorial, eight factorial. Then that happens in four different ways. Also, the two factorial here happens in four different ways, right? So the four here indicates that you can do the two factorial ways in four ways, and then the eight factorial ways also in four ways. And then over the sample space, which is 10 factorial. And then when you punch all of that into your calculator, it simply gives you 4 over 25. 4 over 25. So that's how you were supposed to uh, go about tackling that question there. So I hope uh, you get to understand it now that I've tried to break it down for you. And then with all that being said, guys, please press the thumbs up button if you have enjoyed the lesson and then you found it helpful. And if you've been watching the videos and haven't subscribed yet, please, please, please hit the subscribe button. But most importantly, please share the link with your friends and classmates so that they may also find assistance. Remember, do not be selfish. We are winning as a T.